jump into to week three, we're going we're gonna to look at this question that we wrestle with from Scripture of how do we experience the fullness of life that Jesus has planned for us. John 10, 10 says he came to give us life and life abundant, life to the fullest. And so how do we go about that? And it's, it's a lot like some other areas of our life, you might imagine. This couple of years ago, my family and I were on vacation down in Central Oregon. We love to go down to the Bend area. There's a place called Sun River, a little resort we love to go to. It's super outdoorsy and, and a place to go to be active. And so we love to take our kids there. But one of my favorite things to do when we're in Sun River is the bike ride from Sun River into Bend. It's about 26 miles right along the Deschutes River. I mean, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous bike ride. So a couple years ago, we were doing the bike ride and you get into town and it's a lot of fun, but you can imagine by the time you get done, my legs feel like jello. Like I'm just like hard to stand up straight because uh, it's... I don't know, 26 miles. I don't know about you, but that's not normal for me. So we did that and some people met us uh, in town and we were gonna float the river when we're done. So we hopped on the inner tubes and, and uh, begin floating down the river right through the middle of Bend. If you've never done it, it's a great time. And so we're doing, the, we're doing the float. I got a bottle of water in my hand. I'm trying to rehydrate, but I caught myself doing this. You know, the sun's on top, the freezing water is, is on bottom, and I'm just, I'm just loving life. So I close my eyes, and I just take it in, right? Floating down the river with about 20 of us. We're just having a good time and just, just loving life. Oh, man, I just got excited for summer. <laughs> come on. I don't know about you, but I love summer. That's why we live here, right? Because we like the sun. So sun, come back. Um, but I, I was just loving life until as I'm floating down the river, eyes closed, something hit me on the rear end. Now, I don't know about you. But I'm not about things touching me when I'm in the river, right? That's, that's like, no, thank you. I can't see you. You shouldn't be able to see me. This is not fair. So, of course, I jump up. I open my eyes. And what had happened was, as I was floating down the river, the current had kicked me off to the side. My friends were like, way over there. Current had kicked me off to the side until literally I was all the way up on the bank of the river. Because when you're floating the river, if you don't give it attention, if you don't give it effort, you always tend towards the shallows, right? You always tend towards shallow water. And the same is true in our lives. If we don't live intentionally, if we don't give it effort, we will always tend to become consumed with the shallow things in life. We become consumed with our image. We become consumed with entertainment. We become consumed with other people's opinion of us. And here's the problem is when you're consumed with the shallow things, you can't experience the deep life. You can't experience the richness of life that Jesus promised. And so we've looked at several things, but all of it comes down to this. Deep living is intentional living. It's not something that you stumble into. And so here's the question is, how do we lean into living deeply? Now, John, in the book of 1 John that we've been walking through, you can turn there in your Bible if you have it. In the book of 1 John, John is circling around these topics over and over again that, that we have to grapple with, that we have to wrestle with if we're going to live the deep life that Jesus promised us. I don't know about you, but John kind of approaches writing a little bit like I approach Costco. My wife, I don't know how she does it, but when we go to Costco, she goes through the store once and gets everything she needs. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I don't know how you do that. I'm like, go to Costco. All right, we need some bread. But if you're gonna get some bread, you gotta get some meat, right? So you go over here and you get some meat. But if you're gonna get bread and meat, you obviously need cheese. So then you go back over here and you get some cheese. And if you're gonna get cheese, you gotta get tortillas, right? And so like, I'm just, this is, why do Costco once when you can do it five times all in the same day, right? So, but this is, this is how John is approaching a little bit his writing. It's not this linear case that he's presenting because of this, now this, and because of this, now this. No, he's like, a madman walking around the desert just saying the same things over and over again. But here's what I love about that is it's not like we've got to get like 50 things in line to live the deep life that Jesus promised us. There's a few things that we've got to get right if we're going to live this deep life. We've talked about this, that we have to understand how God, how we're supposed to see God, that the point is not our behavior getting his attention, but connection is the whole point 
of relationship with God. Last week, Pastor Daryl took us through this, this reality that we've got to figure out life with other people, that we've got to figure out that people aren't just there to be annoying. People aren't there to get in the way. No, they're, they're people that God has put in our life for us to love in the way we treat them, to love in action. And this week, here's what we're going to dive into. How, if, if that's how we're supposed to see God, and that's how we're supposed to see other people, how are we supposed to see ourselves? And John hits this really clearly in chapter three. We're actually gonna pick up in the same verse we ended with last week, verse 18, chapter three, book of John. It's on the screen behind me. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. And so we will be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings and he knows everything. Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him. We do the things that please him. And then he wraps it up and he says this, and this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. See, there's not, again, there's not a ton of things that we got to get figured out. You're already hearing again the same themes that we've, we've talked about. But here's what we got to wrestle with today is how are we supposed to see ourselves? A couple, uh, about a month ago now, it was back in Maryland. My, uh, my mom and my brother were back there this last year. We lost my dad to cancer as a result of his career as a firefighter. So we were back at the National Firefighters Monument and... Uh, and celebrating his life as well as uh, many other firefighters. And when we were being transported from the hotel to the ceremony, we sat uh, right in the bus, right behind a family. It was from New York, deep, thick New York accents and kind of picked up from the story that this was uh, uh, some grown children and their mom who had lost their dad uh, from cancer as a result of his efforts at 9-11. And so we were walking with them. It's actually really cool. The son was now grown and had started his own career as a firefighter with the New York fire department. And so we're, we're sitting behind this family and, and I, I wasn't eavesdropping, but I was overhearing, you know, there's a difference. And so I was overhearing their conversation and the grown daughter was, was talking about spending the night in the hotel with her mom the night before and how she had tried to use an app to, to meditate as she was doing to try to become a better person. But her mom kept interrupting her. Well, her siblings were like shocked that she was meditating. So like, wait, time out, what? You, you meditate? So they, they started talking about this. And one of the sisters asked, okay, what was, what was the meditation about? And she goes, oh, it was about generosity. Literally, they started laughing at her like, time out. You're learning to be generous? Or I'm putting together an image of who this girl must be. They're like, you're learning to be generous? And she goes, no, 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 no. It's not about being generous to other people. It's about learning to be generous to yourself, right? And they just literally laughed at her out loud. I'm at this point trying to contain myself from also laughing because then they're going to know that I'm <laughs> a, a secretly a part of this conversation. So I just, I just took it in because here's the thing. Here's why it made me laugh because as humans, we don't tend to have the problem of loving ourselves too little, right? Right? Like, I don't know if you, you feel this way about the people that you live with, but often it's not that we struggle with thinking too low of ourselves. Usually we struggle with thinking too highly of ourselves. But here's the other truth. The, the thing that keeps that in balance is that we also live with hearts that love to hang on to memories of the things that we've done wrong, right? We live with the deep imprint of our life of the things that we've failed at. That's just a natural part of being human is that we wrestle with these things. But here's the problem. If we aren't careful, this memory, this holding on to the failures of our past will keep us from living the deep life that Jesus promised us. When I hang on to what was, I lose sight of where I am right now and the plans that God has for me in the future. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been reading a lot of Eugene Peterson. And he says this, I love the way he paraphrases First John, he says, my dear children, let's not talk about love. Let's practice real love. This is the only way that we'll know we're living, truly living in God's reality. It's also the way to shut down debilitating self-criticism, even when there's something to it. For God is greater than our worried hearts and he knows more about us 
than we do ourselves. I love the way he puts that, but here's the big point that we've got to wrestle with today. When my feelings and God's truth disagree, I have to choose which one I'm gonna live by. We talked about this a couple weeks ago as it relates to sin, but here's the reality. When I see things differently than God, I have to choose which one I'm going to live by. And I believe that today, one of the hardest things for us to agree on with God is how he sees us. One of the hardest things to agree with God on is how he sees us, which means this, it requires that we live intentionally in this area. How does God see you? What's your, what's your, what's your, as you think right now about how God thinks about you, about how he sees you, what are the things that come to mind? Because if we're not intentional, this is an area that can distract us from the deep living that he has planned for us. When I think about self-criticism, this thing that John has brought to the surface, there's two things that I think are the most prominent in our lives when it comes to self-criticism. There are feelings that I would call guilt and shame. And I think a lot of times the reason as followers of Jesus that we struggle with guilt and shame is because part of us kind of wonders if God put them there on purpose. Have you ever felt that way? Like I feel really guilty right now and I, I, I think God might want me to feel guilty. We wrestle with like, did these, did these play a role? Because after all, isn't it my guilt that reminded me that I need a savior? Wasn't it my shame that made me go, God, I need a new identity. I don't want to live that way anymore. So what role do guilt and shame play in our life? Here's how I would define guilt. It's, it's the feeling we get when the gravity of our sin sinks in. The feeling we get when the gravity of our sin sinks in, right? When you think about the things that you shouldn't do that you do regularly or the things that you shouldn't have done that you did anyway. Or maybe for you, it's thinking about the things that you should have done that you chose not to do or choose not to do, right? It's that feeling that I, I, that's not the way I wish it would have happened. And we can feel guilty, but shame on the other hand, shame is the feeling of humiliation that's associated with our guilt, right? Guilt says, I shouldn't have done that. Shame says, I shouldn't be that way. I shouldn't be like that, right? Shame takes our failures and it makes them part of our identity, part of who we see ourselves as being. So here's the question. What role do guilt and shame play in our lives? What role are they meant to play in our lives? What role do they play in our relationship with God? We'll tackle guilt first because I think it's something we've got to get straight. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. It says this, that there's only one kind of guilt that actually belongs in your life. Consider this, the kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow. In other words, God's only plan for guilt in your life is to drive you back into relationship with him. God's only plan for sorrow in your life is to drive you into relationship with him. But so often, isn't it, isn't it true that what we do is we screw up and they're like, okay, well, I'm gonna go over here and try to fix that God. And when I, when I get it all together, then I'll come back to you, right? Because that's what we did as kids. We broke mom's plate. We're like, sweep it up, go plant some, or go pick some flowers. And like, we try to make it all better by doing good things before our parents find out about the bad things we did. Before they find out we screwed up, we're like, oh, but, but look, I also cleaned my room, <laughs> you know? And don't we do that with God? Like, man, I really screwed up. So I'm gonna go do something good. And then it's like, you know, they balance out. But here's the problem. You and I, we can't do anything about our sin. We can't undo the past and we can't do enough good to outweigh the past. Why? Because sin separates us from God, even if we've done good things too. So why is it that we try to make up for it ourselves? You can't do it. That's not the gospel. That's not the good news that you can make up for your sin. That's not God's plan. His only plan is that I would come to him with my guilt, with my sin and say, God, I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. And he gives it freely. It'd be like this. Can you imagine you're driving down the freeway with someone? 
they kind of drift out of their lane and they hit the rumble strip and they're like, oh, shoot, I'm on the rumble strip. I guess I'll stay here till the next exit. <laughs> what? <laughs> that's, that's not what it's there for. The only reason the rumble strip exists is to put you back into your lane. It's to remind you, you don't belong here. You belong over here. And that's the role of guilt in our lives, to remind you, you don't belong here. You belong over here. You belong in relationship with God. So when you feel guilty, if you find that your guilt doesn't drive you back into relationship, know this, that that's not guilt God planned for your life. There's two kinds of guilt that we got to evict from our lives. The first one is this. If you feel guilty over things that Jesus has already forgiven, it's time to reject that. It's time to evict that out of your life. And we're going to talk about how to do that. The second thing is this. If you feel guilt that makes you want to run from God rather to him, that's not guilt that God planned for your life. That's not part of the experience he planned for you. That's not how relationship with him works. So here's my encouragement to you. When you feel guilt, let it drive you to Jesus, not away from him. Because that's the only reason it was there in the first place. So if that's guilt, then what do we do about shame? Let me hit this as, as clearly and as directly and also concisely, because I'm running out of time, as I can. Shame is one of the things that Jesus took to the cross. And when he died, it died. Your shame is not yours to carry. Your identity is remade, is recreated when you say yes to Jesus and your shame doesn't belong to you. When we carry our shame, it's like looking at Jesus and going, nice try, you did good effort, but let me see if I can take care of it. It's something that he already took care of. So when our shame, when, when we wrestle with shame, here's what we see, that that's a tool to separate us from God, not bring us closer to him. The last couple of days, I got to visit someone who's been part of our church for a long time, and she was in hospice care, literally wrestling with, this is the end of my life. Yesterday, she passed away, but when we were, when we were sitting there, we started to talk and and visited some of her favorite songs and the things that she loved to, to look back at. But here's the thing that we talked about is that because of Jesus, when she gets to heaven, God's not gonna look at her record. God's not gonna look at her past and say, well, here's all the things you did wrong. Screw up. Here's all the things you did right. Let's see how it goes. No, that's not how it goes. When we get to heaven, God's not gonna look at what we did. All he's gonna see is what Jesus did. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your record. The Bible tells us that G when Jesus died, he gave us his righteousness. In other words, Jesus' record is credited to your account. When God looks at you, he doesn't see you through your, fel through your faults, through your shortcomings, through your failures. He sees you through the righteousness of Jesus. That's the good news about your shame. Your shame isn't yours to carry, so say no to it. Your shame isn't yours to carry, so it's time to move on. See, I think one of the reasons that we wrestle with how God sees us is because we assume that God's kind of like us. Isn't it true? We look at God and we're like, man, if someone, if someone hurt me as many times as I hurt you, I'd be done with them, God, <laughs> Right? God, if someone came to me and asked forgiveness for the same thing over and over and over, I'd be like, forget you. And too often we can assume that God feels that way about us. That God feels about us, how we would feel about us if we were God. But I'll remind you, we, we sang it, Pastor Matt prayed about it this morning. God's not like you. And that's really good news. God's not like you. He doesn't think like you. He doesn't act like you. God is not like you. So how does Jesus see us? There's three things that I wanna leave you with before we go today. The first one is this. When Jesus looks at you, here's how he sees you. That your value is inherent and it's permanent. Your value is your value because of who he created you to be, because of how he created you, because he put his imprint on your life, not because of what you've done. And it is permanent 
Because there's nothing that you can do to undo your value before God. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 16, a verse that I would encourage you to put to memory, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him wouldn't die, but would experience eternal life. Whoever believes, it's not, a, it's not like Jesus looked at the good people on earth and said, well, there's all the scripts are there, but there's some good people, so I'll die. No, he knew full well who you would be and still chose to give his life for you. Your value is inherent and it is permanent. The second thing we got to know is this, is that you were powerless under your sin, but your sin is powerless compared to the grace of God. There, there's nothing, there is nothing that you could have done that Jesus didn't take care of. So your guilt, it, it's gone. It, it's, it's done. Your shame has no place in your life because there's nothing that you could have done that the cross doesn't take care of. The last thing is this, as we just talked about, when God sees you, he sees you through the righteousness of Jesus, not through the wrongness of your own life, but through the rightness of Christ. When we get to heaven, we're not going to look at God and be like, God, look at all I did. I like served in church on Sunday. I was nice to my neighbors, even though they're jerks. God, I like, I like, I pulled over once to help that person change a flat tire. Look at me. No, it's not. It's not how it's going to go. When we get to heaven, the only thing we have to say is, Look at what Jesus did for me. That's all your father God is going to see. That's all he cares about. I remember, I'll actually never forget the day that I started to wrestle with this in my own heart. I was reading scripture. I was actually in my office as a youth pastor just, just down the hall. And I was reading scripture and it started talking about how Jesus took my shame. And I started to realize the, the gravity of what Jesus had done for me. And it kind of made me mad. Cause I'm like, you know what, God, it's not your fault that I'm a screw up. It's not your fault that I keep, that I keep making mistakes. God, that wasn't your shame to, to bear. You shouldn't have been ashamed because of what I've done. I should be ashamed because of what I've done. And I kind of, I kind of got bothered cause I'm like, God, isn't it my shame that will help me change? Like when I feel really bad about my sin, maybe I'll stop sinning. But have you noticed? The deeper we wrestle with guilt and the deeper we wrestle with shame, it's actually the more we go to sin, not the less. And as God has graciously done from time to time, as I'm wrestling with him, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm all bothered by this. It's like he whispered to my heart. He said, hey, Micah, the reason I took your shame is because your shame, you're right, you're right. Your shame might improve your behavior, but it'll never improve our relationship. You feeling guilty, you wrestling with guilt over the same things over and over and over again, you, you feeling ashamed in life, it might improve your behavior. It might help you not wanna do that thing again, but it'll never improve your relationship. With Jesus, which is why he died. It's why he said, hey, your guilt, your shame, I'll take care of it. So anytime we find these things not driving us to Jesus, we've got to realize that they don't belong in our lives. Today, you might be here and you might have never said yes to Jesus. You might not have decided to follow him yet. Today, you can make that decision before you leave because your guilt and your shame have been taken care of. Someone else already picked up the tab. You don't have to pay for them. You don't have to make it up. You don't have to punish yourself or try to do good things. Jesus already did it. But if you're here, and you are following Jesus. You, you're in this thing. You're like, yes, I said yes to Jesus. But you find that there's guilt in your life that's driving you away from him rather than towards him. Or maybe you're here and you feel like there's shame in your life. When you think of your past, when you think of even today, there's shame because of the things you've done. Just know that's not part of God's plan. See, I love John because he gives us a remedy for our shame. He says this, if the only way 
to deal, to shut down the debilitating self-criticism is this, is let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. That's how we know we're living in the truth, living in God's reality. See, the way to deal with guilt and shame in your life is to stop paying so much attention to you and realize there's people that God has gifted you to love. And when you put that love into action, it shuts down the debilitating criticism, self-criticism that's in your heart. Here's what I'm gonna ask if you would take your connection card with me. And let's, let's take action today. If you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, but you want God's grace on your life, you want forgiveness, you wanna begin following him because you realize that he's the only remedy in this life for guilt and for shame, then today I would encourage you, mark down right in the box on the front, I want to follow Jesus. The reason that's important is we wanna get you resources to take next steps in that. We recognize that this isn't a destination. It's not that we've arrived when we begin following Jesus. It's the beginning of a new journey. And we wanna encourage you on that. But today, if you're here, specifically if you're here and you're dealing with shame in your life, here's what I I would encourage you with. I just want you to write down, I'm done with shame. Why, Why do you need to write that down? Because at some point we've gotta take action. At some point we have to be intentional about saying, I'm done with it. And this, to me, if I could encourage you, this is step number one. I'm done with shame because Jesus already took care of it. Will you stand with me? We're gonna pray and then we're actually gonna go back into a time of worship. The reason I wanted to do that this morning is I wanna take the time to come to Jesus and to let him do in our hearts what we've committed in our heads. Maybe today you said, I'm done with shame. But my prayer would be over the next couple minutes that Jesus would resolve some things in your heart, that he would remind you that your value is inherent and it is permanent. That while, yeah, you were powerless under your sin, your sin is powerless when compared to his grace. That when the Father God looks at you, he doesn't see your faults, he doesn't see your past. That your right and your wrong has no bearing on his love for you, but he sees you through the righteousness of Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you, Jesus, that while I was busy trying to take care of my own sin, that you intercepted me and reminded me, God, that you already took care of it, that the tab has been paid. There is no more due. I thank you that the cross was sufficient for all of my mistakes, that my guilt and my shame were resolved that day and that I get to come to you with all my mess, with all of my shortcomings, with all of my faults, and I'm received with grace, with mercy, with love. Today, Jesus, I pray for those that would say, I wanna begin following you. God, I pray that as they come to you and ask for you to forgive them, as they say yes to your invitation to follow you, God, that you would intercept them again that your love would permeate their life and that God, this journey would be celebrated, that this journey would begin today and continue forever. God, for those of us who have been following you, but we still wrestle with the kind of guilt that drives us away from you. We still wrestle with shame. Jesus, I pray that you'd help us to see ourselves the way you see us, that we would see ourselves as accepted before God, not because of what we've done, but because of the cross, that you would remove that thing that stood in our way, that you'd remove that mountain that stood between us and you. And that Jesus, we would delight in bringing ourself with all of our good and all of our bad into the light to be loved by you. Thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' name.